This is Raul Lopez, and you're listening to How Do You Say Success in Spanglish? The path to success isn't easy. For minorities and people of color, many attempt to journey with little to no guidance. Join me as I sit down with individuals who share their stories of perseverance so that together we can learn how to say success in Spanglish. What's good, mi gente? Welcome back to How Do You Say Success in Spanglish? Today, my guest is Peter Rojas, Assistant Dean of Intercultural Initiatives at Merrimack College. How's it going, Peter? I'm doing well. How you doing, man? Doing all right. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today. Peter Rojas is Assistant Dean of Intercultural Initiatives at Merrimack College. Born and raised in Lowell, Massachusetts, he is the proud son of Colombian immigrants, the youngest of three siblings, and the first in his family to be born in the United States. Peter received his undergraduate degree at UMass Lowell and completed his graduate studies at Florida International University. In addition to diversity programming and initiative, his experience have included working with fraternities and sorority life, campus activities, and student conduct. What exactly is intercultural initiatives? Uh, yeah, so pretty much uh, what I do uh, for my job is really just focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion at the institution. Uh, and that goes from creating events, whether they're social, educational, bringing awareness, uh, talking about different identities and how to understand those identities, right? But also the, the main goal is really creating an inclusive environment for our students at Merrimack College, um, but also making sure that we're creating an educational uh, environment too, right? And I like to tell my students all the time, like whether you like it or not, you're gonna work in a diverse setting. So why not take the opportunity to learn now uh, where you could make them those mistakes and where there is a safety net to kind of correct you and lead you in the right path uh, as you go off into your careers. Um, so aside from that, I do also help out with other initiatives on campus, uh, working for the president's uh, DEI council uh, and also working for the civic engagement one. Um, but that's more like, you know, creating more systematic change within the, the college in terms of those components too. So, you know, I do a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of initiatives and uh, keywords initiative for me, I like to create and I like to, to foster and cultivate new things um, personally and also at the institution. Yeah, and I, I think it's pretty awesome that you, you know, you, you mentioned that you try to help students cater their uh, identity and, and understand identity, especially when you start going to the world, uh, into the real world and start working. Um, you know, sometimes identities really factor in when you're working a new job. It might be the first time working with um, different different genders, different uh, uh, different people, different diversities, and that can, can get kind of difficult, especially when you're trying to start on your career. Um, so, you know, talking about that, let's talk a little bit about you. And uh, you, you, you are the, it seems you are the proud parent, uh, proud son of Colombian immigrants, but you are the first one to be, uh, the first one to be born in the United States. And so usually the first one who's American gets a little bit of that Ah, uh, you're, 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 the, you're the gringo of the, of the family and stuff like that. And you get a little bit of extra push because you didn't have to deal with a lot of that. Uh, uh, sometimes a lot of that other stuff, that like different languages, stuff like that. So how did that kid, uh, affect you early on? No, so I think like, so my parents um, from Colombia, uh, they had my two older brothers there uh, in Colombia. They moved to Venezuela and they made the move to the, to the States. And, and that was really um, something my, my dad wanted to do, right? Big dream, the American dream. Uh, but it was really trying to focus on the um, future of my two older brothers, right? Uh, did the move, everything was good, then they decided to have another kid, luckily me. Uh, and really, it, it kind of set the tone growing up, and, and I'll be honest with it, for the fact that, uh, and I think I talked to you a little bit about you know, Spanglish, right? And I, I joke around with people telling that my first language is, is Spanglish, right? And, and I think it's really concrete to who I am as an individual, right? I, I remember going to school and my brothers would talk to me in English. I go home, I talk to my parents in Spanish. Uh, so growing up, it was really just like uh, a mix of the two languages. And to this day, I won't even lie, there's some words I, I only know in Spanish, I don't know in English and vice versa, right? Um, but also, you know, being the first one to be born here in, in my family overall period was very an interesting journey, right? So people always crack jokes on me. I'm just like, why are you called Peter, right? So my dad's name is Pedro. Uh, my mom wanted to be wanted him to name me after himself, right? But my dad was just like, he's the first one born here. Why don't we just honor him with calling the English version of Pedro, right? So that's why I get Peter. Uh, so it's kind of like a, like a shoulder type of thing, like, you know, living the dream, the American dream, everything like that uh, for my parents and, and, and my brothers and everything. But I think it's been interesting trying to 
and we talked about it, like what what is my identity, right? Because like you said, you know, you mentioned, you know, being gringo and everything like that. Yeah. For my Colombian side of, you know, when I anytime I visited Colombia, it's very like, you know, you're really white. You're not really like one of us and everything like that. Um, not to say I, I don't embrace the roots, right? I do absolutely whatever. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't I don't have the typical Colombian accent that you would see in the media, right? Um, and you know, not even my parents have that, right? And they're from Medellin. Uh, but I think it's also understanding of like different provinces within Colombia don't have the same accent, right? Um, so it's kind of like being those stereotypes at the same time. Um, but also now even like being an American too, is just figuring out like, you know, I'm the token friend and you know, you should do this and that. But also even being here in the States, it's just like I'm I'm too white, I'm not Hispanic enough, or the vice versa. So growing up, it was always that struggle of like being in that in that environment who who was peter going to be that day uh and trying to not scorn myself on like your, your failure not being that that individual you're supposed to be right that those expectations of um you should be a typical colombian or you should be like the american bull boy and everything like that so uh i say growing up was very interesting and you know i still go through that today in certain um environments that i'm in but you know it's a, it's something that you learn and you try to find your your pinpoints to kind of achieve in the environments that you're in and, and trying to understand who you are. But, you know, it's always ever, ever changing uh, as you grow up. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, you're the youngest of, of, of all your siblings, you know, youngest of three. Uh, so, you know, it's not only are you the youngest, you're the baby. Uh, you're also the only American born baby, you know, for all of that stuff. Um, was there some sort of, um, you know, lots of times when you're the youngest, you're you're treated differently or your older older siblings are are kind of set to guide you and push you forward and you're always compared to them and stuff like that was there anything like that going on for you uh, throughout your life yeah absolutely i think like when we talk about the american american dream right and, and you talk to anyone who's a person of color or just grown up and like that american dream like you want your child to go to harvard or the best schools and everything like that like my older brother right hit it off the bat he ended up going to Harvard, right? So you can imagine, like, you know, my parents, like, all right, our first son went to Harvard, an immigrant, and everything like that. Now a citizen, he went to Harvard. Uh, the second one going to, to Boston University, another prestigious school in, in the United States, right? So, like, you know, my, my family, my brothers, you know, set the tone about, like, what the dream is and everything like that. Um, but, you know, there's comparison, you know what I mean, at the end of the day, in, in terms of any sibling, you know, sibling rivalry or anything like that. Um, but, you know, it, I think it was just more of a, not only are you doing it for your family, but also you're, you're doing it to live up to a dream. You know what I mean? And like, you kind of want to make sure that you fulfill those dreams for, for your parents and your family, everything like that. Like kind of the, an added pressure sometimes people put up upon themselves and everything. But overall, I think, you know, I did have the support. I know for me, like I did have my own, you know, bad decisions or anything yeah. like that um, for what it is. And like, who doesn't make a bad decision? But, you know, I think it's sometimes it's, it's living up to those expectations, um, especially being the firstborn, right? Because my mom would always say that to everyone, like, oh, hurt my baby boy, you know, American, everything like that, like, live the dream, everything like that. And there's expectations, you know what I mean? Like, whether you want to believe it or not, like, there's a there's something you have to follow, right? And you don't want to make, you don't want to disappoint anyone uh, along that path. Yeah, and so you, it's, it's, it's uh, amazing, especially for immigrants from Colombia to come in and have three, you know, three siblings, three kids. Um, three of all of which went to college and, you know, amassed some great success for themselves. Uh, so, you know, that's just, I think every immigrant coming into this country, that's their hope and dream for their kids. You know, I hope to eventually get there or whatever. So you ended up going to college and I see, yeah, you, you went to, uh, you graduated from UMass Lowell, but UMass Lowell wasn't the first co school you went to. Uh, tell me no, about so, that. Yeah. So my first college I went to was uh, UMass Amherst. So I went to, uh, the joke, you know, I went to the zoo. Um, I like to say that UMass Amherst was the, the school that gave me my degree about being an individual. Um, I think for me, my struggle with, with going to, to a large institution, now that I think about it, uh, was I went to a private high school, it was small. I was more focused on the intimate, you know, getting to know the professor, smaller classes. And my first class at UMass Amherst was me and 500, 500 other peers. And I was like, oh man, what am I doing here? Right. Um, and I kind of lost that love for education. I won't lie. I, like, when I was in high school, I was getting straight A's. My GPA was like a 3.67. You know what I mean? I had my few B's here and there, but um, kind of lost that love for academia, right? And it was just like, I felt like it wasn't for me. Uh, and I know for, for me, it was kind of hard to be like, all right, where did where, where is this mishap going? Why am I not 
having that same passion for academics. And I think it was just the fact that like, I didn't know what I want to do for my life. Um, I was jumping around from majors here and there. Um, and I was very stubborn. I was stubborn and I kept trying to get my GPA high. And, you know, I went from like a, what was it? Like a three, six, my first semester. And then ended up dropping to a below a 2.0 or sadly, you know, at the end of the day, I had to, um, I was on academic probation. I got suspended from the school uh, and I wasn't able to return for three years. I wish I would have probably taken a break, right? Just taking a moment. But I think for me, it was twofold. I didn't want to give up on the dream for my parents and my family, right? But also I'll have the stereotypical Latino aspect behind me. I was stubborn. I was like, no, I can get through this. You know, like, no, no crying here. We got to get things done, everything like that. Um, but, you know, life happened and it didn't pan out that way. But things happened. Uh, I think what ended up, what, which I do appreciate now, was I had an opportunity to go work in the real world, do different jobs like retail. I, I think the one job I did appreciate was being a vocational coach um, at a school that catered to students that, that were on the spectrum. And my goal was to, uh, to bring them to work in offices and, and get them acclimated to learn how to, how to work, right? Um, it was very interesting to to see that that type of life and, and to understand different mindsets and, and how those students think and you know the perspective people have you know especially if they're not educated on those with you know any types of disabilities or anything like that um you know a lot of them when you talk to them they're like, we're just like you you know there's nothing you know you have your problems i have my problems and i think i i appreciate and very grateful for that experience and it kind of motivated me back to be like all right you know like you know i shouldn't be stressed out and depressed the fact that I didn't finish working. Yeah, I did you know I did have my mental health issues, but you know, it kind of jumped me back into school. Um weirdly enough, I couldn't go back to UMass Amherst because I was working full time. Um so I had to go to the nearest school, which was UMass Lowell. Uh but I had to go to community college, which I have a new appreciation for community college, um, to get boost my GPA because UMass Lowell was like, your GPA is terrible. I need you to prove that you can do it. Um uh, but it was good to just have the experience like community colleges, you know, there to help you out. Um, to get you to that next level. So we went to Middlesex, first semester, finished UMass Lowell within a year. Uh, luckily, I did well in my minor, so I was able to transfer those credits. Uh, and then my mindset was on school, so I went straight to, to grad school, um, decided to get away from the area to get a different perspective in life. Uh, so I went to Florida International uh, in Miami, so I always joke around, took my talents down there. Um, but, you know, I appreciate that experience too, and I think it brought me to another level as an individual, but also being a, a Latino, seeing what life is for, for a Latino down in Florida, right? And, and what that experience is, because you know, it's, it's different wherever mm -hmm. you live, you know? So I think that was a cool experience too. And, you know, living in that environment in, in terms of how people treat you there too. Um, but it was good. I do appreciate that experience also. Yeah. And so, you know, just to kind of rewind a little bit, you know, it's interesting when you talk about, you know, most people, when they start their first year in college, they do really bad and they got to work their way up. And you seem to have done really good your first semester, but slowly that started coming down. And then you talk about, a little bit about your mental health uh, kind of being a factor and all that. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so I think, well, I mean, and I think a lot of the times where, you know, I never really talked about my feelings and never talked about my emotions. I kept everything in. Uh, I thought I could do everything on my own. Which is a very uh, common thing for Latino men as a young absolutely, adult. Right? Suck it up and keep 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 working hard. Yeah, you, you suck it up and, and do it. And I, and I think that I just got that from from my brothers. Um, and I think that's just the way I knew life was. Right? I wasn't I wasn't an individual that'd be like, hey, you know, love you, mom. I love you, dad. I love you, brothers. Like, I'm going to talk to you about my feelings and my problems and vents and everything like that. It was more like I just got to do what I got to do. And you know, what I mean, like. I'm pretty sure my mom and dad, you know, they've gone through their struggles and like from, you know, immigrating here, like they don't, they, my dad would wake up at four o'clock in the morning to go to work. My mom would wake up at early, go to work, get me ready for school and everything like that. And I'm over here, like, I can't do a paper. You know what I mean? Like, so my mindset was just like, what am I doing? But I think overall, just the, the pressures that were going on it's finally got to me. I had my depression. I had my suicidal attempts um, and no one knew about it. Right. And, and I was really good at, at hiding that. Um, and I think that's really sometimes with the Latino or the Latino population, we're really good at like hiding our emotions, right? Until it, it blows up where mm -hmm. you can't do that part, right? Um, so a lot of people didn't know what I was going through. And I know a lot of my close friends up until this day still don't know that I, I didn't really graduate from UMass Amherst. Uh, and sometimes they get shocked and like, wait, UMass Low, what are you talking about? I never really shared that experience. It's only to like past few years, I've really been more open about it and mental health. Um, uh, it's very important. I think it's 
you know, seeing friends that have, you know, committed suicide or just seeing other people that are going through that, you know, having that ear for someone and let them know that there is someone to go to. Um, I'm fine proponent about going to therapy. I go to therapy too because um, it helps out. It's good to have someone there to kind of bounce off. That someone's neutral too because I think a lot of times people don't want to vent to their friends for A, their mm-hmm. friend are going to be like, I don't want to hear from your your crap again. You know what I mean? Or, you know, there's a burden aspect behind it. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, I think overall what ended up happening was just like I just lost that passion on the academia side. And um, my main focus was I was super involved in college, too. So I think my focus just got driven to, like, being involved on campus and and helping the community out. And, like, my passion was just shifted. But I didn't realize I got to shift my academics also with that passion. So, um, Sometimes I do think about it and like, you know, do I regret not trying to make a better effort or, you know, if I would have had better resources where things would have been different. Uh, yeah, sometimes I think about it, but now like how life has panned out, if it wasn't for those experiences, I would not be where I am today, being an advocate for mental health, being an advocate for even diversity and identity um, and cultivating that. So, I mean, uh, you can say I'm a believer in the universe saying, you know, making things happen, but, you know. Is, is really trying to embrace all those things in the past and, and making them into something better. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you, you, we, we touched on a good point there where for a lot of us, uh, mental health has not, never been a priority in it. Um, you know, we deal with a lot of things when we come to this country. It's different when you're, I don't, well, I don't know how different it is, but, you know, when you're, you're coming from someplace else and you're, you're raised one way and the rest of the world is slightly different, you know, you you deal with things and you internalize a lot of it. That identity crisis affects you, regardless of whether or not you believe it or you you think you're you're handling it well. You know, sometimes it does help. And mental health is usually one of the big ones for our culture that we don't talk about. You know, what I mean, we we don't look at we um, we scoff at when we think. You know, sometimes we we look at we, at weaknesses when people start saying, "Oh, I'm feeling depressed," and you know, get depressed, get depressed. You're not depressed. You don't even know what depression looks like. You know, you don't know what or, what living a hard life is about. You know what I mean? And you know, I I tend to do the same thing. You know, I tell people, you know, it's really important to do therapy, and it's really important. I've seen I have a lot of friends who are therapists, so I tend to talk to them a lot um, and get their feedback on it. Uh, one of the brothers too, uh, Renee. Uh, Garcia, you know, and, yeah. you know, it's just, it's one thing that our culture really needs to um, rev up on the importance of it. And it kind of sucks that for a lot of us, we we tend to wait until we get to a point where, um, you know, we, we don't realize we need it until way later in our lives, as opposed to starting early, you know. Um, and so, uh, but with that in your things that you've been going through, you know, you, you talk about your identity crisis, what was the kind of turning point for you that made you decide, um, hey, you know, um, I know exactly what I want to go to. I, I'm starting to figure out who I am and where my path, lead, what I need to do to move to my path leading forward. Yeah, I think, um, and it's funny because like, you know, a few months ago, I was talking about like the universe and everything, like that, and other things, components adding to like the Latino culture is just like the religion component to it, right? Like, I would never dare tell my mom I was depressed because I'm like, the, I knew the automatic response was like, but God will be there for you. You know what I mean? Type of thing. And we're like, and that's like, that's even a struggle for a lot of uh, families, especially like a lot of Latinos are on the Catholic faith where, you know, people don't, don't, don't either believe or don't have the patience to be, have that faith and everything like that. And sometimes like, you know, it's hard to, to believe in something that you don't see. Right. And I think that added, that adds to it too. Right. Uh, but to go off on, on the question you just asked, I think it came to a moment where, um, or was it, man? I, I was literally, I was in Columbia, um, thinking about going back to school, right, to get my bachelor's and everything like that. And I was having that moment, just like, you know, I need to go back, and I, I needed that that sign, right? And I, I had gone back to Columbia, and I had not been there for years. Um, and I went with my mom and my dad, and that was the first time my dad had been there in like twenty five years. So like, that was an experience to have cool to be there with my dad. I've gone previously with just my mom. Uh, but I think it was just a realization of, you know, the, the struggles they've, they've gone through, right. And, and how they parented us, how they parented me. Um, but like how they lived their life gave a purpose. Right. And I think for me, I came to realize that like my failures and, and, and the academia side, but also having my own identity crisis within college. And, um, but I also had this passion of like wanting to give back and, 
promoting awareness that I knew that I needed to get to a place where I need to be in a environment, a, a location, maybe higher ed college where I can tell students that are probably feeling like me going through the same struggles and tell them my story, right? Um, and have them realize that like, you're not alone. I think one of the main reasons why I didn't take that break, you know, back at UMass when they told me I, I should probably take a break was the fact that like, you know, and I don't think I, I don't think until that point at UMass where like I had someone that didn't look like me tell me that I should take a break. I was like, well, what do you really know, right? Like you don't, you've never lived my life. Like, you know what it is being a Latino and everything like that. And that, that comes like the whole stubbornness behind that, that I think for me where I can, I kind of look like some of these students and I have some similar backgrounds of, of growing in a city, an urban area, you know, having the public school, but also the private school mentality behind it, that what I'm telling you is a lived experience. I'm not shooting the shit on this part, right? I'm, I'm giving you some real life experience that I think whether you want to take my advice or not, you know, it's coming from, from a place of, of good intent. Um, and I think that moment I was just like, I, that's my purpose. My purpose is to, to come back and, and figure out how I can help these students out, figure out how I can not have another Peter out there. You know what I mean? Where they're struggling and everything like that. Um, so I, I think that that was that moment just being, and I think it just helped out being, uh, going back to the motherland, right. And, and, and kind of seeing how, how they grew up and how they lived and, and that kind of really see what they what they were talking about and i think it was good that my dad went right because i got to see his perspective of it um i've been there several times like a mom like i said but just hearing him and talking about his life there and, and why he why he left right so i think that's because at the end of the day, he's the one that made the decision my mom followed him and you know and brought the kids along and everything like that but like he made the decision to to go and, and take that journey with blind faith and hoping that everything was going to go well that I think I just I embraced that moment too. I was just like, man, let me just do it. Let me, what's the harm of me going back to school, shooting my shot, see what happens. If it's if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. But I think everything that's happened in the past six, seven years is meant for me to have this purpose to to give back and advocate and and let these students know that like you're not alone in this whole situation and uh, we're there to help you out. Because at the end of the day, I'll, another thing I tell students like you're gonna struggle. You may think that because you got straight A's in, in high school and you played four or five different sports and this and that, that college is going to be perfect for you. You're going to have a moment, right? And that's why we're here to help you out in these moments and make sure that, you know, if you fall, we pick you up and we bring you up to the to the finish line. Yeah. And it's interesting that you mentioned that because I think um, for a lot of uh, children of immigrants, the the mentality of thinking well, my parents sacrificed so much for me, you know what I mean, can act as both a burden and sometimes a motivator, you know what I mean? For a lot of us, you know, when I was in college too, and I was failing and, uh, and doing really bad, my mentality was, how bad can this be if my parents sacrificed everything to come here for me? You know what I mean? They, I, I remember when I was a kid and we were in Rhode Island, you know, my mom um, worked at a jewelry factory making jewelry. And she'd bring a machine home and make jewelry at home at night while she wasn't working to make extra money because they got paid by piece. So the more boxes they completed, the more they got paid. They didn't get paid per hour. So the harder they worked, the more they made, the more, the more money they did. So she'd come home and do extra. And me and my sister were popping little earrings on those little plasticky thingies that hang yeah. on in the thing, you know, at like, you know, five, six years old, help my mom make all these jewelry that get sent out to these stores. Um, and you know, I think about stuff like that too. You know, when when I was struggling, I'm like, you know, if my mom and my dad were willing to work and do all this extra stuff, you know, we can do that. But sometimes it does add an extra burden as well, where you're like, I think initially for me, it was a burden, but eventually it became my motivator. You know what I mean? It was me feeling I'm going to let them down because of all the sacrifice to being, okay, everything they sacrifice means I can do it too, you know? And you know, improve and so and so, you know, I, I I totally get it, man. And and it's it's kind of um real interesting the way you put it. Uh, and like it's nice now that you are able to take that knowledge that you have and that experience that you have and place it into your job and your career um and are able to give back to the school. So when we talk about the school and we talk about diversity um uh, and inclusion uh within a university, um every college does things differently. And we already know for the most part a lot of colleges uh Black, Latinos, and other people of color 
make up a really small percentage of an overall university um, almost everywhere. I think there's very few schools where uh, minorities make up things outside of um, historically Black universities and some of the, uh, for Latinos, I remember when I was a counselor for Brown, you know, it was like Central University, uh, Central Florida University, that was like 50% Latino, you know, and I was like, whoa, that's, that's crazy to think about that in that type of environment. So what kind of stuff do you notice now when you have your students and the people coming in that you, um, one, that you're able to identify now and say, yeah, I remember going through that and this is what I think we could do to improve it. Or what are some of the things that you notice now when you're with, with your students that you're like, we're still lacking? Um, I think one thing like, I, like from the automatic I see with some of my students um, and I, I, I go back really into my times at, at UMass, um, was that I had my white friends, I had my Hispanic friends, but then I wasn't Hispanic enough. I wasn't too white enough. So I was like in the middle, right? And then I had to like figure out how to, and I think that's why I, I, I never knew the term at that point, but like that's when I had to learn how to code switch. Mm -hmm. Be like, okay, like how can I be more this and that? How can I be more that and that? So I can feel like I'm being embraced for who I am, right? And I see that a lot with some of my students I do work with, uh, especially, you know, some of that, it's a predominantly white institution, right? And, and walking in there where, you know, they went to high school with mostly white peers, right? And they're coming in and they're trying to find their way there. And sometimes they don't get the automatic embrace where their default is like, all right, let me go hang out with people that look like me, right? Um, and then that's like an obstacle too, right? Because they're just like, oh, like, you know, what, what, what are you really trying to do? Are you really one of us or not, right? And, you know, we're kids, you know, when you're younger, you know, there's like that that idea of like, are you part of the crew or not? Um, and you see that, right? And, and you see a, some, and, and there's one particular student that, you know, I talk to a lot of the times. And I think what I what I learned was that you just gotta be authentic to yourself. I think the moment you try to start go switching at an early age, although it's a interesting skill to have, right? I'll say it for itself, because you, you learn how to, to navigate the room and certain things that, that you're in. But if you can't be authentic to yourself and you can't be true to yourself, then yeah, you're going to go down the slippery slope of like, who am I really? Right. Um, because when you go back and forth and, and you try to please people um, to try to make them like you, but at the end of the day, like you gotta like yourself, you gotta like who you are. And if people don't like you and your personality, then why, why bother? Right. And, but at the same time, I understand being young, it was really like, I want everyone to like me. You know what I mean? Um, so I, when I see that with some of my students, I, I think it's just like, you just gotta be authentic to yourself. Uh, and I know you're going to you're gonna struggle for the next two years trying to figure out what that looks like and, and how you're going to deal with it. But the moment you you are OK with who you are and what you're about, your values, you embrace your identities, um, everything becomes easier. You become at more peace with your mind. Um, and I and I say that so easily, but I know, like, even to this day, I still try to I go through my own situation where, like, trying to find that peace and trying to find my authenticity. Right. I think for the most part. I would say at ninety percent, I know who I am, and when I walk into a room, people know who I am. But you know, there's that, there's that ten percent, right? There's that ten five percent that is in your back of your mind of like, you know. And I think I'll speak for myself, just like, damn, and like, I'm not, am I not being too Colombian enough? Am I, am I dis, am I disregarding the, my roots, or am I not like being for the people or anything like that, uh, or vice versa with you know, depending on my identities, right? Yeah, sometimes it, it creeps up, right? And I think, but I think it's just always reverting back to like who you are as an individual and, and what your values are. Um, I think when it comes to like things that we can still progress on, I think it's just providing the spaces um, for our BIPOC students uh, or first generation international immigrant students is, is just bringing out the spaces for them to, to really be themselves, but also having the right people to develop them. Right. I think, yeah, I think this generation is, is very savvy and, and, they have the internet at the tip of their fingers and they could really learn all that stuff, you know, through YouTube, TikTok, whatever the situation is, and they can learn. But I think at the end of the day, it's it's having that human interaction, having those experiences said to them. Um, right. Because there's one thing of like, you know, there's one thing about reading a book, but it's actually living what you read, what you read uh, is two different things. Right. Uh, and I think it's whatever you can watch or whatever you can read is one thing, but if you can sit down with someone and have a chat and, and talk about their experiences, it's a different opportunity. It's a different um, realm and you just cultivate a different mindset with students um, and whatnot. So it's really cultivating that space. Um, and it's really also getting all the faculty and staff that 
have those identities to come and help out. And I know at our school, we, we have a lot of those individuals seeking to help out. And I think it's, I think it's our, it's our obligation to give back, right? It's our obligation to the mold, the next generation that we have for, for all individuals, period, right? Uh, obviously, you know, everyone has their bias of trying to help out, you know, people that look like them or have shared experiences and everything like that um, to help them out through their journey, right? But so I think it's just still creating more of those spaces and to help develop them in all those different components. And it's, you know, development is great, you know, and I think that's one of the big things you touched on early on as well with your with your job is that you, you help develop these students to not just develop as a person, but also be able to develop them to be able to, in, to interact with these different diversities because when they go into work, you know, I think when a lot of us, we go into college and when we, we grow up, we grow up in an environment that's comfortable to us most most of the time. You know, if we went to a school that's predominantly black or Latino or, you know, and, and we go to college and we stick to that type of people, we, we we go back to our the people we're comfortable with. We might stick with more of the people we grew up with. And then when we go because we need to feel comfortable in college. And when we don't feel comfortable, we don't succeed as well in there as well. And it makes it harder for us because not only are we dealing with the stress from from college, but we're now dealing with not not feeling comfortable as well. So it adds two folds to the challenges in there. But at some point, you need to start commingling. You need to start getting in there and, and, and dealing with other people. Because when you go to work, you're going to deal with the same thing, except there aren't going to be organizations at work that are specifically, oh, this is the Latino club of your job. That doesn't exist. You know what I mean? And some of the more um, forward-thinking companies are starting to have you know, very, are very big on the diversity and inclusive um, and they do stuff like my company does, uh, things like that as well, but not every job does that. You know what I mean? I, I, my last job before this, you know, everybody I work with or the majority of them were British, you know? And so, you know, I, I, I really, not only was it a colored thing, but it was also, you know, the, um, the country thing where I'm an American and most of my coworkers were, were British. So, you know, you talk about that development and, what type of things do you guys do for your students to help them um, develop and prepare themselves to get into the real world? Yeah. So what I, what I try to do, um, and I'm laughing because I'm thinking about like, did they ever ask you about if you watch soccer and what's your favorite soccer team? Um, yeah. And they asked me. They, they also asked me about the uh, what do I think about the um, the royal family and and all this oh, stuff. Like, and I was there when the queen died. And I was like, they took off time of work and closed everything. And I was just like, oh, my, yeah, I, I just don't get it. It's not myself. But yeah, it's like a whole new different level. So. Yeah, you probably have like a, a favorite English Premier team now that you probably follow now. Wake up uh, every Sunday. Yeah, it's only um, what it's whatever the one is from Ted Lasso. So <laughs> whatever. Oh, you see Richmond. Oh, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Um. So, yeah, so going back on uh, on the question, I think um, for what we do, so uh, one of my first initiatives when I started working at Merrimack um, as a coordinator was developing a diversity awareness badge, right? And it was just a workshop. It was like a three-day workshop because I was trying to like give time to people to really develop, right? And it's really just on fundamental basis of, 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 of diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Going from like learning your, learning about your identities, how they intersect, you know, what are some identities that are privileged? So what are the ones that are oppressed? How can you use certain identities to kind of move the environment that you're in, the spaces to help other people out, uh, or for you to kind of learn and develop more? Um, and then going into the other different things like implicit bias, microaggressions, uh, power and privilege, like understanding the types of power to for you to move the masses, make some change, right? And the goal behind it was, like I said having development, but also understanding like you have the power to make change, right? Um, but also, I think for me and, and kind of what you were just pointing at was that my job is to make sure that people get comfortable with the uncomfortable, right? My goal is to push you to your limits to make you think about these situations, right? What do I do if I see a coworker that's being harassed or, you know, what what is my obligation as an individual, right? What if I see, you know, a microaggression occurring? You know, how do I take it, right? As an individual, do I do do I go off and start yelling at my coworker? Do I learn how to navigate through the politics in the workspace? Um, those all of these conversations happen within, within this training. Um, I do have other trainings that I do specifically cater to different offices and different uh, student employees that we do have, depending on what they do. Um, that can go from like inclusive language, especially when we're talking with orientation, right? Making sure that like when you're being hospitable, 
you know, that you're, you're saying your name clearly, you're using your pronouns, um, you talk about your identities comfortably and everything like that, respecting one another uh, on that forefront and, and things like that. Um, to dive in a little bit deeper in terms of like the power and privilege component, um, I know there's a, I use that same program to do something at a high school in Lawrence, uh, Central Catholic, my alma mater, right? And um, it was called Be the Cause. Uh, and that was the same notion, right? And, but it was really focused on like um, defining your A, right? Um, do you want to be an ally? Do you want to be an activist? Do you want to be an advocate? You know what I mean? How do I show appreciation to others? Because um, I think that one of the things that when we talk about DEI is that we don't get into the path of showing grace to people, right? I think when someone messes up, we go right, we go full attack mode. Let's cancel this person, everything like that. But I think that sometimes like there's some people that just generally have never been open to those ideas because they've been in, you know, in certain environments where like maybe all their friends are, are white or all my friends are are men or female or this and that, you know what I mean? Like sometimes it, it does come a place where it comes from a place where like I just genuinely didn't know and like, please help me and teach me, right? Um, don't get me wrong. Are there certain situations where it's just like, all right, you're being a complete ass? Right, yes. I think we can dictate based on, on, on body language and, and how the tone of voice is, but I think it's it's making people realize that, you know, we all have a shared experience, right? And sometimes when I do these trainings, I start very vague, right? From being like, hey, what's your favorite TV show? All right, bro, you and I like Ted Lasso. Okay, what else do you like about that show? Oh, I like when they talked about mental health. Cool. Do you deal with mental health? I do too. How do you deal with that? You know what I mean? Or like, you know, I love that show, by the way. It's, it's, yeah, uh, it's a golden job. for like good it, leadership and all that stuff, right? It, 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 and it's, it's just so damn charming. You can't hate it. It's like, you, you know, it's not the funniest show in the world, but you start watching and just like, oh, it's a great show. You know, it's like you yeah. just can't. Uh, all right. So you, you kind of go vague and you, you dive deeper into it, right? And, mm -hmm. and have these conversations and like, then you have the moment like, oh, wow, like, I never thought you and I had something in common, but we do. But it's deeper than that, right? Um, and I'm not going to say that you're going to have those deep relationships with every single person, but I think it's understanding that you got to show some grace, some compassion, um, patience uh, with everyone, and, and try to sh to make sure that you support them in their their journey to being educated, also. Um, but also know your boundaries too, right? You know, respect yourself too in terms of like you don't need to be the spokesperson for all you know, Latinos out there or, or black or whatever ethnicity or gender or anything like that. You don't have to be there, but you can probably guide them in the right direction, right? You can provide them the resources and everything like that. Um, Cause I think the, the more we're on the same boat with everything, the, the better that we're going to go into this journey and go further with everything. And it's, it's interesting. You, you pointed out the fact that for a lot of people, you know, the lack of understanding isn't, isn't on purpose it's just the consequences of how they were how they grew up you know they might have only had one black friend or one white friend and for a lot of people you know in that scenario where they grew up you know surrounded by like all white people and they don't know how to deal or act around people of color um and then you have the flip side where you might have that one black kid at that white school who doesn't know how to act and they they have to figure out their identity at that point and then a lot of them a lot of times you'll see it with a lot of us and we'll mention it, it was like, oh yeah, that guy, he 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 grew up with all white kids. You know what I mean? In Texas, we see a lot of Mexicans that you wouldn't know they were Mexicans because they like fifth generation, they grew up with all white friends, they don't speak Spanish, and the identity, you know, shifted for them to be more to what they're surrounded with. And for a lot of us, and a lot for a lot of them, they don't understand you know, what this identity crisis is for us and how it affects us. So it's wonderful to see that, you know, you guys are able to pick up on that in school um, because college is generally, for a lot of us, one of the first times we deal with, uh, deal with this majorly. Uh, and so it's, it's really cool to see. When you're looking at how you're dealing with stuff now and how you're dealing with uh, your students now, and the stuff that you guide them and you teal them and develop them, what would what is something that you kind of wish you would have been able to tell yourself before? Man, if I were to talk to 18-year-old me, 19, 20-year-old me, I think, um, yeah, there's so many things I would have said <laughs> on all honesty, but I think it's just like, you know, take take the advice, no matter if they look like me or didn't grow up in the same environment as me. Um, you know, just take the advice. I think I probably would have been in a better mental state, right? But I know why I did it. You know, I didn't want to disappoint. 
I didn't want to um, not disappoint myself, but also my family too, right? You know, college is a big thing. I think my, my parents pushed education as, as the thing, right? Knowledge is power uh, on that cliche of a saying, right? And, and I didn't want to disappoint that. So I think if I would have showed grace to myself, right, and, and try to understand, like, having those conversations with, you know, my parents and let them know that, like, you know, I'm just going to take a break. You know what I mean? I'm going to finish what I got to finish, but I need to just focus on myself for a bit. Um, but also when I say that with the grace part is letting myself know, like, it's okay to do that, right? Um, I don't have to follow the societal. I got to finish by 21, 22. Um, I got to be the the all-star whatever and everything like that. I, I will say, like, I'm definitely blessed to grow up the way I did, right? Like, I went to public, my, my mom decided to throw me in the inner city of Lowell to go to public school, right? Most people don't do that. They're like, go to a private school or like, let me not, you know, if, I, if you don't have to be there, whatever, whatever. But I went there, I learned what it is to kind of be living in Lowell and, and some of my peers going through the stuff that they had to go through. Like, same thing, their parents are immigrants. Some of them were in gangs. Some of my friends, you know, didn't make it out of middle school and everything like that. Or, you know, we ended up going our separate ways when I went to private high school and I stay in touch with some of them and, you know, they didn't even make it high, through high school and everything like that. So um, I think it's just showing grace to myself and understanding that it, it's okay. Right. And I think that's the one thing that I tell my students now, like, you know, it, it's all right. You know, I think it's one of those things that it's a hard conversation to have, but in the long run, whether you want to believe me or not, right. Um, it's going to be better for you. Right. Um, Cause I think if I would have taken that break, I probably would have finished by the time I was like, I don't know, maybe 24, 25, I would have gone back to school right away and everything like that, probably. But, you know, I didn't finish school till like 29, got my master's at 31, you know, so um, it's really that. And I think it's just, you know, you, you put your ad, you self pressure on yourself because um, you want to live to expectations for yourself, but also the individuals that you kind of want to make sure that you make them proud too. So, and I know that's something that's a deep stigma within um, our culture right and making sure that um we are successful right and i think the other thing too when i say that is just like although you know comparing my life to my parents is two different things and it possibly you know is a good motivation it's different though you know what i mean like i go through my struggles in a different way i think about the generation now like i don't know how how i would have lived as a young young student with social media nowadays you know what i mean like i think i would have fallen in the trap and be like oh my god everyone hates me like what am I going to do? Why don't I have friends and all that other stuff, right? Where I think I, I probably would have taken a bigger hit mental wise, right? Um, and, and you're a father now too. So that's something like, I mean, that's something that goes through my mind as well too. It's like, what, what am I going to have to deal with with my daughter? That's different from what I have to deal with, you know? And how can I, how can I tackle those issues with her? You know? So. Yeah. You know what? And like, when I see, when I, when I see my students now and like certain, certain things that they do, I'm like, I mean, I'm not even gonna say I'm old like that, but like, damn, like I'm old. Like this is a new generation. Like they're the train of thoughts, and yeah, you start thinking about that, and then like you kind of relate that back to your own parents and, and figure out like, you know, what they were thinking and and how they were like, you know, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna make sure that they're successful and everything like that? Um, and I think a lot of the times when individuals like with family members, parents specifically, in, in our conversations, the fact that like, yeah, I'm not gonna fault my parents for anything. You know what I mean, like. They did the best that they could. They knew what they had to get done um, for the betterment of who I was. Same thing with my brothers. Like, I'm not going to fault them for, for how they treated me. I think the, the tools that they had, they thought that was the best tools to have, right? Um, and, and I think that's a lot of the times where, like, people that that go through that struggle sometimes and, and put that blame upon other people or themselves, it's like, understand the tools that they had. You know what I mean? Like, if you're only going to give me a a hammer and a screwdriver to build a house like this i'm i'm going to try to build you the best house that i can right but understand like these are the tools and resources that i had at the moment and and hopefully that you know you like this house that i've built for you um but i've given you tools to think about hey get some other tools there are other ways to build this house you can be an interior decorator and make it how you want it to be because i provided you at least a foundation um for your own home and now it's really up to you to to do that and i think that's where i am now is just the fact that i have my foundation Right. Um, and I, you know, my parents, family members, friends um, have provided the pillars of, of my home. So now I'm just I'm chilling, trying to figure out how I, I can make this look like a nice house and 
I have uh, my new fascination with being a, a plant dad too, right? So how am I going to make it look nice and everything like that? But, you know, in, in my line of work, I want my students to have that nice house too. Yeah, wonderful. And, um, you know, I, I really appreciate you coming here today and taking time to talk to us. And it looks like the work you're doing is wonderful. And I hope you get a lot of success and I hope a lot of your students benefit from it as well. Thank you. And uh, for everyone else, thank you for listening in. I hope you'll continue to join us and uh, we'll continue to learn how to say success in Spanglish. <laughs>